Richard Grannon, whom I have come to respect a great deal, produced a piece in which he more or less laid out his method for the coaching that he does uh, for people who are suffering as a result of their interactions with persons with cluster B disorders of various kinds. And what I found particularly remarkable and want to add to uh, in many ways, saying that my experience mirrors the theory he just outlined. He talks about honoring, or that's that he calls the fancy American term, or just acknowledging what feelings you have for his patients, uh, clients, whatever he calls them, who come to him and say, look, I'm sick of doing this. I'm sick of feeling this way. I want it to be over with. I want it done. And they've it may be a, we're have working on this for 20 years. They're not worried about their childhood issues anymore. They don't think this is about their childhood. I'm not sure that I do either, necessarily. <laughs> Certainly, the, I'm going to argue there's a childhood predisposition for victims, but not for cluster Bs, whom I believe suffer from a condition that is almost certainly 90% uh, or more genetic and that has only one known environmental factor that increases the rate of progression of what is already a degenerative condition. And that's head trauma. Other than that, I don't even want to talk about those suffering like your cluster bees here because what's important is those of us who are here trying to heal. We should talk about ourselves. And that's what Grant's doing in this piece. And people come to him to talk about themselves or they don't, is his point. It appears that good victims for cluster bees are persons who simply deny, repress their own emotions, actually. That is the key. If they do, then they can suffer the abuse because they're in the habit of simply repressing what they feel. It's a survival technique, and it's what the cluster bee ought to be looking for, someone who can take the punishment. It is, it so it appears, and Grant seems to suggest, given the client who will come into his office and the old psychological question, well, how does that make you feel? has a good basis in concept, but he lays it out as to why it will work so well and should work so well for victims of cluster bees. And that is how you feel is simply repressed. He says, his rule is when you tell me, because you're usually up in your head, denying both your body and your feelings, because you're a victim and the head's safe, it can comfort, it can explain. And I've said that some of us cannot heal until we understand. That means we're highly in our head, denying both motion and body. So he tells his clients, patients, um, you can only answer that question in adjectives that describe emotions, period. And all of a sudden they're silent because they don't have any. For many of us, particularly victims of cluster bees, we don't even think about how we feel. Or if we do... We have a very limited vocabulary for understanding how we feel. We go, well, I feel good, or I feel bad, and that's about it. And I don't even want to think about it. I've got this work to do. <laughs> now, my own personal story overlaps with those folks, he says. By the way, just to go back to him and give him credit for where he goes with this, he then goes, well, you can't. Heal that. You think you've dealt with your baggage from way back, but you haven't. And that makes you continually susceptible to people who are going to see this, well, repression of your own emotion and victimize you by it because you need to be able to feel. And if you can't, you can't defend yourself. You got to feel what's coming. You got to feel what you feel. Honor it. It's part of you. Why wouldn't you? It is you. Now, my own personal story. I like to say that I was born in the summer of my 47th year. And I'm kind of alluding to John Denver there, who in Rocky Mountain High says he was born in the summer of his 27th. I guess I'm, well, maybe 20 years late. Either way, it was one of the most remarkable things 
I woke up to the notion, thanks actually to socionics, which is kind of a Jungian cognitive theory, um, but that mm, ignores Myers-Briggs for reasons I don't want to go into here. And it comes out of Freud, ultimately, but really Jung nailed it. And Psychological Types is what you should read, by the way, chapter 10. <laughs> Jung in that book is funny. He takes the whole history, the whole Western history at least, of thought on the subject of psychology and does nine chapters on it. None of that is anything but summary. And then in chapter 10, he goes, okay, and here's what I think. Wallop. <laughs> it is an amazing chapter. I read the description of the F.E. Dom. Now, at this point, I'd already made that massive discovery. Hey, I may have been testing like I-N-T-J or I-S-T-J for years when I looked in my own brain. Because that's who I thought I was. And indeed, there is some gender bias. Men are supposed to be T. Women are supposed to be F. Men are supposed to be more I. Women are allowed to be more E. Anyway, those kinds of biases <laughs> may have had some influence, but really, no. I'm a T, or felt I was a T, because I denied my F. I found it in the summer of my 27th year, or 47th year, actually. And I had now have a theory as to why that was the case. But what happened is this. Once I discovered no and Really, socionics allows this to work because T is redefined as logic, or at least in English it's translated back into English as logic, whereas F is ethics. Understanding feeling as ethics really, really allows me to go, wait a second, I happen to be one of the most ethical humans, in my opinion, that I know. I suppose we all are. Well, no, some are not. Some, not, some are evil and know it, but... <laughs> we like to think of ourselves that way. I do. It's part of my own uh, image. And it actually does pretty much match my behavior. I'm very Mr. Goody Two-Shoes in many ways. So, and I've been trained to be, right, by this demanding superego that says repress your feelings. It doesn't matter if I hurt you. Just do what I say. Already susceptible to that. But the way I became susceptible to it is to deny my feelings. Once you pretend that doesn't make you feel, you're not sensitive to it anymore and the abuse can continue. That is the key point that I want to make there. One must learn to feel. You can't just go around going, I feel good or I feel bad. You certainly don't ever want to be in a position where you're in front of somebody asks you, how do you feel? And you go, huh? Oh, I don't know. I wasn't thinking about that. Gracious. Once I recognized this is actually the most developed and strongest part of my brain, I started cognitively, actively feeling things. And of course, it's <laughs> socioeconomics will tell you that, for example, my primary strength, extroverted ethics. F sub E in Jungian terms. Extroverted feeling. And by the way, Jung's description <laughs> is so beautiful and so embarrassing to me. Give the F.E. credit. Civilization would be impossible without it. Somebody's got to convince you to take a short-term loss for a long-term gain. F.E. does that. We make you feel good about it. And honestly, we're right a lot of the time. But that's not the point. <laughs> it's also, it reminds me of the classic, at least in the southern United States, uh, saying that if, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. I don't know if you've heard that one. But... <laughs> that is such a bitchy, whiny cry, baby. Oh, just, ooh, ooh. you know, irritable, but then joyful and blissful and happy and just a powerful feeler. But also one who can naturally, very, very easily adjust the emotional temperature of other people. Just very naturally. And it is manipulative. There is no doubt about it. But I can assure you, my children's friends want to come over to my house for parties. You know why? Because it's emotionally managed. It is care I carefully watch and direct the emotional tenor. And so everybody has a good time. I mean, I'm benevolent with it. You know, if I want to make you feel bad, of course I can. 
I, but I feel guilty about it usually unless I feel it was just really just and even then I want to talk about it and sort it out because I don't want to feel bad about having done something bad. So, <laughs> but you know, you, once you're conscious and I, I really did take me that long to go, wait a second, I do operate like that. And then you look at your whole life. You think you're this introvert. You think you're logical and you discover the pattern is just obvious. All my entire life, I have been ENFJ, an ethical, intuitive extrovert. Ugh, junior class president. I was speaking publicly like in fourth grade to adults. Um, and, and my entire school, every class in it, first or kindergarten through eight. Well, maybe first or eight. But anyway, yeah, I know I've always been an emotional manager. Um, but I was so in denial about my own. It's extroverted. I, I can do the outside, but me? No, I don't even know that I have emotions. I'm so, they hurt, <laughs> right? And, but Grant's point is it must be lived in the here and now. You must feel it in the here and now. You must honor it. You can't. You think you've been dealing with your issues for 30 years, but have you? No. You, you are so out of touch with your emotions, you have no idea. Also, socionics, I should note, mentions that ethics are rational. When I ask you to pay taxes, which is a short-term loss, why would people give up money? I'm not getting anything back, or at least not that you see or that you recognize and some people are getting more than me there's plenty of jealousy out there about that but i convince you to take a short-term loss in favor of a long-term collective gain i have to convince you as an fe in order for civilization to exist that you have got to trust this person and that you've got to take to give this person money give this person something and the benefits to all of us as a collective will be enormous that's a tough sell, and that's what makes civilization possible. So I've been doing this all along, thinking it's logical. Well, it is. What Sessionics reminds us, and actually even Jung says is F, ethics, is a rational function. Rational in that sense primarily means it can be translated into a language and explained. I believe it's Galenko's description, or I forget, of the EIE of me. I can paint a picture with words. More importantly, though, I think, and the reason an art metaphor is used there, is I can make emotions rational. I can make ethics rational. I can ask you to feel what other people feel and get you to understand that and actually feel it a bit. And then moder and then you're, you'll, on your own, moderate your behavior because now you're sensitive to the feelings of others. I do that for everybody but me, <laughs> which I deny mine entirely or had been denying them entirely until the summer of my 47th year. That would have been 2014. Now, what happened? My ex and I renewed our wedding vows when she turned 40, and that would have been October the 11th of 2013. Within five months, she began a stream of online affairs. But you know what I think really happened? I could sense something was wrong and went into research mode, which is what I do. T sub E is my role, by the way. Extroverted logic, find an answer, solution. Problem solution is T, logic. But so I went, on, went to my role because my ego was failing me, F-E-N-I. I saw future dangers coming in. I was screaming at me. But... <laughs> uh, and Effie's going, yep, that'll hurt, that'll hurt, that'll hurt. So the whole ego is going, we can't fix this, but we see it coming. I have to go to my role then. I go to extroverted logic. I look outside of myself for answers. Research, read, 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 write, process, that kind of thing. And that I started to do a lot. Hundreds and hundreds of pages of writing, days upon end of reading, a lot of work on it. And I learned what my ethics are, what ethics are. I mean, I had some kind of sense, right? But <laughs> ethics is rhetoric. Ethics is the first thing that was taught in schools in the West. 
It's connected with democracy. Civilization, period, says Jung. Anyway, yeah. So I started speaking that language and learning who I was. And that was possible either. Because for that period of time during that summer, I felt safe finally. I actually trusted her again because of those renewal vows. I felt safe enough to explore me or... I was left alone by her because she was busy torturing other people. And one ought to consider this as an option. In fact, toward the end, I even wrote to her, Look, if you're going to be a spath, I only ask this. I know you're going to do evil things. I know you're going to hurt people. When you do, would you please mind hurting people who don't love you as opposed to the ones who do? And that was my last deal. (laughs) But in any case, either way, I had the time there to do that or the cause and the motivation to discover who I was. And Granin points out that, and what I want to just emphasize here again, is that those of us who were injured as children learn to be obedient people pleasers, very conscientious, tend not to feel our emotions. We actually are probably experts at them because we've had to be sensitive to the emotions of others because we didn't want to get punished by them. However, we're experts at it, but we deny our own. What he forces, well, invites very strongly his patients, clients to do is to explore their own and learn who they are. Once you can feel this person that perhaps you've been with for a long time, Once you can feel that, you have the choice to either continue feeling it or not. That'll be up to you. I hope this has helped. Have a good day.